Hello and welcome to the Fighting Spirit Podcast. As always, I'm Jason and I'm here to bring you your fight picks for UFC Fight Night where Valentina Bullet Shevchenko will be taking on Liz Carmouche in an international fight card taking place in Uruguay, Montevideo. It's going to be a really good one, I think. Let's get into it. Here's the show. <laughs> All right, so in our main event, we're going to have Valentina Shevchenko defending her women's flyweight title in what should be an excellent matchup, and I think that she's going to end up retaining it here. So Liz Carmouche is a very good fighter. Like, she's a legend of the sport. I mean, if we look all the way back with her fight at Ronda Rousey, uh, taking place at UFC 157, I mean, that was an amazing moment in women's MMA, and she's been a really great fighter since then. You know, she's taken some lumps, she's taken some losses, losses to likes of Misha Tate, Alexis Davis, Alexis Davis twice, you know, she is a great fighter, and I just don't think she's at this top tier right now, at least any longer. So the sport has moved on. We saw this with Ronda Rousey. You know, things just keep going on, and the older fighters aren't necessarily able to keep up with the growth of the sport. And that's where I think Valentina slots in against Liz Carmouche here. Is Liz Carmouche a great brawling fighter? Yes. But is Valentina a great technical fighter that seems to be able to beat anyone except for Amanda Nunes? Absolutely. I mean, we've seen what Valentina Shevchenko has done to everyone else besides Nunes, and she took Nunes to, play, to split decision. The head kick knockout of Jessica I. She out-techniqued Joanna Junjacek. She defeated Priscilla Cachuera. I mean, borderline murdered her uh, with a really bad stoppage from Mario Yamasaki. I don't think there's anything Liz Carmouche can really do, but maybe just try to get a ground and pound on. Shevchenko is a decent grappler, but her takedown defense could be exploited, I think, here uh, by a great uh, takedown artist like Liz Carmouche. She tries to get it to the ground as much as possible. It could be dangerous, though. Like I said, that submission game of Valentina is there, and I'm not sure if she's even able to get this thing to the ground. Her best chance is, you know, that takedown attempt to pound it out or turn this thing into a scrap and into a brawl. Valentina likes to keep it a technical Muay Thai kickboxing affair if she can. And she, Liz Carmouche's best efforts are going to be to frustrate Shevchenko and potentially get her to get out of her mental, you know, state. But ultimately, I honestly don't see this happening though. I am picking Valentina Shevchenko in this main event. In our great co-main event, we are going to have Vicente Luque take on Platinum Mike Perry in what should be a great fight. And as much as I do like the entertainment value that Perry brings to the table, I ultimately think that the silent assassin Vicente Luque is going to get it done here. So we know that Luque has a very good history of striking, right? Look at his last four fights. TKO Derek Krantz, TKO Brian Barberino, KO Jalen Turner, KO Chad LaPriest, and then he sneaks in a submission of Nico Price uh, via a Brabo choke in the second round. So this guy is on a tear right now. He hasn't had a loss since Leon Edwards, whereas we've seen Mike Perry, you know, bounce up and down, right? He is a great fan's favorite, but he has lost the likes of Ponzinibbio, Max Griffin, Donald Cerrone. He does have some good wins over Alex Oliveira and Paul Felder, but those were decisions, you know, and it was just a split win over Paul Felder. I think that Vicente Luque is just a way superior fighter, and I think he poses a greater threat here at the welterweight division. When we look at striking, I think Vicente they just deals it out better. I'm not saying Perry isn't tough and he couldn't potentially brawl with Vicente Luque, but I ultimately think the technique and the you know uh, composure of Vicente is actually going to pull through here. And then we look at that submission game. Perry does not have any submissions to his record. He's not a grappler, whereas Luque has six submissions over his 16 wins. And so if he has to get it done on the ground, he will. He will execute a takedown. We know that Perry's takedown defense isn't you know, the best in the business, it's decent enough, but it's not the best in the business. I think if Luke wants to dictate that this thing goes to the mat, he's going to make it possible. So we are picking the silent assassin, Vicente Luque, in this matchup. In our next matchup, we have a debuting fighter. So we're going to have Humberto Bandene from Peru taking on a debuting fighter in Luis Eduardo Gagori 
from Brazil. And I think this is going to be an interesting matchup because, you know, Humberto appears to be on the slide. He's on the verge, I think, of exiting the UFC. He's taken two straight losses in a row, and he only had his first win in the UFC come as kind of a fluke 26 seconds into his first round against Martin Bravo. He's lost to Austin Arnett. He's lost to Gabriel Benitez. And I'm not sure he's going to be able to hang with this, what looks to be like a very, very competent fighter, in Luis Eduardo. Now, he is a debuting fighter, so we don't have all the best information, but I think based on his record here, how he's getting it done, his super high fight IQ, 11 wins, just two decisions over that, and he hasn't had a decision since 2016. This guy is shutting the door on people. He looks technical, okay, based on what I've seen from him. I think that he's going to be able to defeat this declining fighter. Also, even though this fight's in Uruguay, we have both South American fighters here, one from Peru, one from Brazil. It's kind of hometown-ish, not much travel here, and I think ultimately the Brazilian gets it done here. I am picking Luis Eduardo Garagori in this matchup. In our next matchup is going to be a light heavyweight grudge match because it's going to be Volkan, no time Ozdemir, dynamite hands, whatever you want to call him, taking on the sledgehammer, Ilir Latifi, and like I said, is going to be an amazing grudge match at this light heavyweight stage. So, when we look at these guys, obviously, you know, they could be in potential lineup to face a guy like John Jones, right? John Jones is clearing out the division. He needs fresh talent. One of these guys could get the call up or potentially fight Blaskovitz after his defeat of Luke Rockhold, right? This match could be very important in this division. And when I look at it, though, I think no time Ozdemir is the one to get it done here. I also think he's the better challenge to John Jones because he has good striking, maybe not the grappling, which Jones could exploit. But either way, I like his striking here. When I look at them, that's kind of the tail of the tape, too, here. We have a lot more grappling experience out of Latifi, and we have a lot more striking experience out of Ozdemir. Now, we've seen Ozdemir get manhandled by the likes of Daniel Cormier, but let's face facts. Latifi is not Cormier. Ozdemir has a very good takedown defense rate, and I think he's going to be able to stop this smaller man. This is a man that's only 5'8", that fights at 205. I think he's going to be able to shut him down, keep him at range, use the advantage there, and stick and move out of the pocket at will, and turn this into a striking affair that plays into the hands of Dynamite here. With that being said, though, we have not seen very great outcomes from Ozdemir recently. So when he lost in Boston to Cormier, right, then we got a loss to Anthony Smith. We got a loss to Dominic Reyes. This guy needs a W. I like him here. I think he's still on track to make it back up the ranks, but he really needs one here. And we look over at Latifi. He's, you know, kind of a win-loss, win-loss kind of guy with a couple of wins, Tyson Pedro, Ovin St. Preux, and then picks up an L to Corey Anderson who would potentially, you know, be fighting at some higher tiers in the near future. But either way, I like Ozdemir here still. We're picking him in this matchup. In our next matchup, we're going to have another debuting fighter because we got Rodolfo Vieira taking on Oscar Pichota in what should be a very good middleweight matchup. So Rodolfo doesn't have that much experience, you know, in MMA, but the guy does have a lot of BJJ experience, and he's basically getting all of his fights done on the mat with the exception of one KO, but he's never taken it to the decision over his five wins. So four subs, one KO. He's going up against a very good Polish fighter here. So we look at Oskar Pichota, and, you know, he only has lost in the UFC to Gerald Mirsic. Now, Gerald Mirsic is a great grappling fighter, so this might prove to be a chink in the armor against a fighter like Vieira. And there isn't a whole lot of information to go off of because of Vieira having, you know, no experience in the UFC. I ultimately, though, am going to pick Vieira because of that chink in the armor where Pechota was was lost to a rear naked choke. I can definitely see Vieira taking the back. I'm sure he's watched Pechota's film since he's been in the UFC and has an idea that he can get this guy to the mat and he can submit him. We are ultimately picking Vieira in his debut bout in this one. Our next matchup is very, very tight and it's going to be Enrique Barzola, El Fuerte, taking on Bobby the Wolfman Moffat. Also, excellent fight name. Both these guys. The Strength, Barzola, I mean, these are solid, solid fight names. Either way, I think that this is ultimately going to play out with a full moon for the Wolfman. I think he's going to get in there and tear it 
up. So when I look at the numbers, we obviously know that Moffitt, not the greatest striker in the world, but decent. He's the kind of guy that uses strikes to set up takedowns, to set up his grappling game. He doesn't just rely on scoring the takedown. He plays a full dynamic game that allows him to get inside and score those nine submissions over his 14 wins. When I look at Barzola, he is a balanced fighter, but I don't think his grappling is quite there. Yes, he does have four submissions over his 15 wins, and he does have some pretty good victories out there, but he also has a low fight IQ right now. This guy is not closing the door on anyone. Did he have a four straight win win streak going into fight Caviar Aguirre? Yes. Did he win all of those by unanimous decision, not knock anybody out, not submit them? Yes. This guy has not done anything of note since he was fighting in Peru. His last win via stoppage was in 2014. When I look over at the Wolfman Moffat, yes, he's not winning all of his fights. He took a loss to Bryce Mitchell, but before that, he chokes out. Chaz Skelly chokes out Jacob Kilburn and he chokes out Jonathan Jackson and this guy has the IQ to get it done against El Fuerte. I can see him doing it. I think his striking is going to be good enough to get this thing to the mat where he's going to be the most comfortable and he's ultimately going to be able to get a win here. He also trains out of MMA Lab. He has very good training. I think he gets it done here. We're picking the wolf, man. It's going to be a full moon in Uruguay. Again, with another debuting fighter, in fact, both of them are, we have Cyril Gagne taking on Rafael Paseo, and it's it's a tough one to call, I gotta be honest. Um, Gagne is a huge favor in this one, Peosa is a huge underdog, and for what it's worth, these guys are very equal, you know, the one edge I'm giving here to Pezosa is that he does have more experience, right? He's a 9-0 fighter versus a 3-0 fighter. And we know when you get to the UFC, you can't just lean on some natural talent. You have to be the real deal. And I think that's what Peosa is actually going to be here. I think that he is going to get the victory. Now, I'm also saying this too, because I think he's a good risk you can take. I think the payout is pretty good when things are so unknown that from a sole gambling perspective, I actually do like Nunes here as well. But honestly, this is really a you pick him. I don't think I can make a great call here, even like the other debuting fighter. There's just not enough information with either one of these guys having fought in the UFC and with one of them having so little experience. So just to throw it out there, though, I think this thing is so lopsided because Cyril was a Muay Thai and K1 fighter. He only had about 10 fights across those. Yes, he was a champion in France at a smaller stage. So again, he does have that slight edge. I can see why he's so heavily favored, but don't count out a real MMA fighter, a guy that can take you down. Granted, this guy doesn't have, you know, a crazy submission game like I think would be best to, you know, exploit Cyril, uh, but I think Pissosa can get it done here. He's going to be hungry. He is a great Brazilian fighter. We know they're we know they're renowned for their toughness. I think he can get it done here and shut down the hype train on Gagne. We are picking Rafael Peosa in this matchup. In our next matchup, we are going to have Tiny Tornado Tisha Torres taking on Mariana Rodriguez in what should be a pretty interesting strawweight fight. So ultimately in this one, I do like Rodriguez, and a lot of that comes down to the fight IQ and just point-striking nature of Tisha Torres. Is she 10-4? Does she have some very good victories? Yes, absolutely. Does she have a lot of power in her hands that I think is going to allow her to overcome Mariana, who looks like a knockout machine right now for this lady's debate? Okay, maybe I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit. Her last one was in the Dana White Contender Series via TKO, but she hasn't lost one ever, and I think that she has the skills to pay the bills to put Tisha Torres away. Torres has zero KOs over 10 wins, one submission, and basically takes them to decision every time, whereas we know Rodriguez, she has six finishes, one sub, one, or sorry, five KOs over her 11 wins. I think her fight IQ is higher. I think that her output is good, and I think that she can overcome Torres here. Also, neither one of them great big time grapplers. So I do see some, you know, kind of evenness there and basically staying on the feet. Although, one trump card, two Torres. She does see some of the best fighters in the world over at American Top Team. She has some of the best training in the world at American Top Team. So do not count her out in this one. However, I ultimately got to pick the higher IQ fighter here, the one that shuts the door in Mariana Rodriguez. We are picking her in Uruguay. All right, in our next one, we have a pretty close matchup. This one taking place at Flyweight and should be a pretty good fight. So we're going to have Rogerio Bontornin taking on Rulin Paiva. And I think it's going to be a question of 
Can Paiva keep it standing? Can Von Torrent get this thing to the ground? So striking-wise, I think Paiva has a very slight edge, not, not to knock Von Torrent in his hands and his striking ability, but this guy likes to get it done on the mat. 11 subs over his 15 wins. He has that great PJJ skill. He also has picked up some decent wins so far. He did get a rear naked choke win in the Dana White Contender Series, and he edged one out against Magomed Butalov, a wrestler, in what was a good fight. He did get that split decision there. Paiva also looking good, except he did have a loss in, in his debut against Kai Kara France. It was a split decision loss, but he lost nevertheless. So I'm not sure how he's handling the big stage right now. We know that Rogerio Bontorno, he can overcome adversity, right? He had that split decision win already in the UFC. He's fighting under the lights, and I think he can continue it by picking up a win here over Paiva, especially if he's able to get this thing to the ground. Ultimately here, like I said, we are picking Von Tornin in this matchup. In our next one at Bantamweight, we're going to have two fairly green fighters in the UFC going at it. We're going to have Geraldo DeFreitas Jr. taking on Chris Gutierrez in what should be a pretty good matchup. So these guys are fairly even, I think, on the feet. Slight edge, really, to Gutierrez. I think he's a little bit better striker. But Freitas obviously gets the nod here if this thing goes to the ground. Five submissions over his 12 wins. I think that he's a slightly better fighter here. And I think he's also on a great win streak right now. The guy has not taken a loss since 2015. He's shutting the door on guys. He's getting... KOs, he's getting submissions, he only has three decisions over his entire career here, and Chris Gutierrez, we know that, uh, you know, he does push it to decision if it comes to that, you know, a six decision wins over his career, and he does have a win and loss in the UFC, he has never, you know, actually shut the door on anyone in the UFC though, and I'm not sure he's going to be able to do it here to Freitas Jr. We are picking Geraldo in this matchup. In another very close, almost you pick him setup. At a debuting status, we're going to have Rodrigo Vargas Cazula take on Alex da Silva Coelho in what should be an interesting fight. So both these guys fairly even. We have the boxer out of Mexico, 10-2, and two, going up against a great Brazilian fighter, 20-2, and two, fighting out of Brazil. And I, I think it's just you pick them. Both these guys look very good. You know, obviously, we do have um, Rodriguez coming off some wins outside of the UFC. We have... Silva coming off of a loss inside of the UFC in his debut, lost via guillotine choke in the second round. So it's a tough one to call with limited information. Uh, I honestly got to say Vargas, I think is a slightly better fighter here, but this one, this is one that's a straight up you pick him. I'll be honest. Either way though, I'm taking Kazula in this one. In our next matchup taking place at welterweight, we have kind of a phenom from Russia, Alexei Konshenko taking on a stalwart of Brazilian MMA in Gilbert Burns. And so this is going to be a very interesting one. Kunchenko has obviously fought in the UFC a couple times now. He's gotten two decision victories. Not overwhelmingly impressed with the way he's getting it done in the UFC, considering he had 13 KOs coming in. But hey, he does. He is a good fighter. Gilbert Burns, though, we know he's tough. We know that he can get this thing to the mat. And we know that that's what he's probably going to try to do to Kunchenko. But we haven't really seen Kunchenko go up against this level of fighter yet. And it's a really hard one to say. He does have okay takedown defense. I hope he's working on it to match with his boxing and amazing striking. If he cannot prevent the takedowns from Burns, I think that he's going to end up getting dismantled here. Ultimately, though, I think his striking, his KO ability will finally be on showcase here. I can see him potentially getting the TKO win over Burns, so we are picking up Konchenko in this matchup. And in our last matchup at Ladies Flyweight, we're going to be having Veronica Macedo take on Pollyanna Viana. And this one should be pretty interesting. I think that most of the skill set, though, favors Pollyanna here. She has the greater submission game. She has the better striking game. I think that this is, you know, this is kind of tough. But I think this is a way for Vienna to get back to her, you know, kind of winning ways. Both these fighters are on long losing streaks, right? I think that potentially both of them are on the way out here. You know, we do have Vienna at least getting a debut victory in the UFC, but for the entire time Veronica has been here, she has not had any luck. Uh, she came into the UFC, lost to Ashley Evan Smith, TKO elbows. Then she loses to Andrea Lee via decision and a rear naked choke against Jillian Robertson. She, I think, is on the verge of being cut. And I think that's ultimately going to happen here when she picks up her fourth straight loss in the octagon. So we are picking up Pollyanna Viana in this matchup. All right, so let's go over them one more time. We will have Shevchenko, Luke. Garagori, Ozdemir, Vieira, 
Moffitt, Peosa, Rodriguez, Bontornan, Freitas, Vargas, Vienna, and Konchenko to round things out in Uruguay. All right, so that takes us on to housekeeping. You can get in touch with the Fighting Spirit Podcast at fightingspiritpodcast at gmail.com. We're also on Twitter at MMAFightPig01, and there is a Patreon as well in the description of your podcast or down below if you're watching this on YouTube. If you would like to support the show in any way, you can also find us on your podcast platform of choice as well. So, speaking of the Patreon, though, you can support the show at any level that makes the most sense for you. You can become involved with our beer review the dollar level you can get those betting tips at the five dollar level or become a producer on the show getting your credit read here for twenty dollars per month and every tier above gets the tier below them so you at twenty dollars you'd be getting everything that i have to offer to you in addition to this amazing free content which if you are not a patreon feel free to continue listening on your free feed of choice i do appreciate the listening and please write in as well a mailbag is probably one of my favorite segments of this show also, I want to mention that we'll be dropping our first Patreon-driven beer review on Thursday, so look out for that one. I won't reveal what it is, but if you're a Patreon, you know it's coming down the pike, so really good one in store there. And of course, we'll have another one two weeks thereafter, and then a new poll, and then, hey, get on the Patreon and get some more information about that, right? Okay, so I will be back with the retrospective come Saturday or Sunday, depending on timing of these things. It is an international card, so I'm not sure right now if I'll be able to get it on Saturday, but I will get it out as soon as possible. And until I speak with you again next time, happy fight picking.